Assholes may ruin your project, and Donnie's going to tell you uh, maybe what to do about it. Donnie Burkholz. Thanks, thanks for the uh, overly kind introduction. I'll, I'll do my best to uh, keep things interesting. So um, this project, or I guess the story, is all about uh, the last eight or nine years I spent contributing to a Linux distribution called Gentoo. And started out sort of in the trenches doing just a single developer thing. And uh, over time, gradually ended up um, in sort of a position of leadership. And in open source, you know that doesn't mean you get to tell people what to do, it means you get to ask them what to do more often. Um, and so over time, um, things were going great, but then uh, we ran into some tough times. And um, I'm going to show you some quantitation that I've tried to do on one of the hardest things to quantify, which is people, communities, rather than code. It's easy to quantify code. We saw some of that with the uh, Cloud Foundry talk yesterday. You can look at pull requests. You can uh, do all kinds of metrics on lines of code, number of commits, and so on. But how do you quantify a community? Um, and here's my alternate title. Um, I thought it fit, because um, that's what they do, right? And I guess here it would be arseholes to be proper. <laughs> but but you, you get the idea. So just do the mental translation if you're from the UK. Um, so just kind of a very brief introduction to how I view communities. Um, I see it as, as a cycle. So you're, you're taking contributors, you get some results, those results create a reputation, and that reputation gets you new contributors. And it's the type of reputation that have that determines the quality and the characteristics of the contributors you get. So you're either getting you know, these rock stars who are amazing people, or you're getting sort of the death stars that are destroying your project. Um, so your ability to get results is really dependent on your community. Um, it all goes back to the people involved, and they're what creates the code rather than somehow the code creating the people. Um, so if, if you imagine a community, I picture it as a scientist like a Gaussian distribution. Uh, so you've got a, a bunch of sort of average people in the middle, people who are you know, nice, friendly, they get along. Um, you've got these assholes on one side, on the far negative end, and you've got these amazing charismatic people uh, much more so than myself, on the right side. Um, so, you know, there's most people in the middle and a few at each end, and the question is, what kind of impact do they have, even if it's just a few of them? <clears throat> so this is a graph um, of Gentoo over the past uh, 10 years or so on, on Olo, and what we're seeing is the number of committers. And uh, you may not be able to see the numbers, so I'll just tell you on the left side, the axis goes from 0 to 300. Um, it, it peaks out at about 250 and then drops back to 200 toward the end. And my question was, why did this happen, right? It, it looks like things are going great up until about 2006. And then all of a sudden it peaks, it drops off, and then it flattens out. So what kind of events could have driven that? Um, the first thing I thought was, surely Ubuntu was it, right? Because that's sort of the new hot thing in Linux is everybody's running Ubuntu, everybody's talking about Ubuntu. But if you look at the timeline, well, no, not really. Ubuntu has, I mean, you might be able to say things are, are dropping off a tiny bit, but nowhere near as much as you see at that, that sharp peak of 2007 or so. Um, but then I started thinking about community, and I started caring more and more about community over time. So going back to this, after you know, learning something new, you can come up with new insights every time. Um, so going back to this, after being deeply involved in, in getting rid of these assholes that were contaminating the whole project, I realized that there was actually a correlation between these three people out of 200 people, 250 people even, um, a correlation between when, when we started getting complaints about their behavior and the drop off in the number of people committing. Um, and look what happens, it flattens out as soon as we get rid of them. So we, we had started this you know, steep decline that's almost equivalent to the, the rise, but then things flatten out. But you can see now that there's a long term impact even after you get rid of them, you still retain the reputation that I was talking about in the beginning. People still think of, of Gentoo as a community that has issues, um, even though that was four years ago now. Um, these kind of things really, really stick to you. So I've shown you that there is a real impact from assholes, and then the question is, uh, 
what, what is an asshole? How do you identify them? Uh, what do you do about it once you find them? And it's, it's a matter of some contention because you could say, oh, well, anybody who has an argument must be an asshole, right? Uh, but no, that's not the case. Conflict is healthy, right? If you look at uh, some huge companies like Intel, they actually have formal training in how to fight with people. Um, because you have to learn how to keep your emotions out of it and how to avoid personal attacks and stick to the technical details. I mean, that's you know, one of the most important things you can do is, is sit back, take a breath, and make sure you're focusing on the project and on the technical side of things and not on the person or you know, ad hominem attacks. Um, so there's a very simple test, and the test is all about the eye of the beholder, right? You've got that phrase here, sure? Okay. So after talking to somebody... I think we invented it. <laughs> Along with the assholes, eh? We have those in space. <laughs> so, so the question is very simple, and it's, do I feel bad after I've talked to this person? Um, and if you're talking about this one time, that happens, right? Everybody's got a bad day. Or sometimes, you know, you are just very tender and your feelings are easily hurt, like James here. Um, but if it's a pattern, that's when you have to start caring about it. Just like anything else, when things build up over time, you're looking for the patterns. Oh, I was sure that was going to be you being an asshole. But no. No, just kidding. Because that's not a pattern yet. If it rings again, though, I'm coming after you. So, so you're looking for patterns, right? If something happens, you know, two, three, four, five times, or if, if you're getting complaints from multiple different people all over the place about one person, that's when you have to start thinking about this more seriously and you know, whether you should actually take some action. Um, so one question I had was, can we balance out the bad people with the good people? If you imagine that sort of Gaussian distribution, if you have some great people, does that counteract the bad ones? Um, and it turns out there's actually all kinds of research about this. There's people over in the sociology side of things who have been doing this research for decades. Um, so how can we bring that into tech? And it's, uh, I think Mike Malinka just was saying yesterday that all these things have happened in the past and we ignore them. So that's what we've been doing with community. There's all this research out there and we've been ignoring it. So what can we learn from that? Um, and this one happens to be from an excellent book called The No Asshole Rule, which I highly recommend to all of you. It's a great read. Even as a sort of academic text, it's one of the most interesting books I've read in the past 10 years. Um, and I've read thousands, so that's saying something. So the question is, how many interactions does it take that are bad to balance out a good one, or the other way around? Um, anybody think, let's say, more than 10? More than 10 good to balance out a bad? <coughs> yeah, good crowd. How about more than five? No? How about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, okay, so I'm saying 10 bad one, 10 good to cancel a bad, five good to cancel a bad. How about uh, one good makes up for five bad actions? Anybody? Well, it turns out um, there's a number to this, which amazed me, but five to one is your number. You have to have five good interactions to balance out a bad one. And this isn't just in, in technical projects and in, in workplaces. It turns out this also applies to marriage. Seriously, they've done the research. If you, if you are in a marriage and you have five times as many good interactions as bad ones, the marriage will stick. If the ratio goes down much more than that, the marriage falls apart. I mean, it's, it's very interesting stuff. So if you are thinking that uh, you're doing a lot of insulting your husband or your wife, um, consider adding in some compliments, like five times as many. But if you imagine this on, on the level of, say, 200 people, that means that you're just breaking even if there's one out of every six who are an asshole, right? One out of every six interactions is bad. You're just breaking even. But the problem is that these things, they build over time. Um, and they have this sort of cascading effect. So I'm not going to go through all these numbers because nobody wants to hear a bunch of bullet points. But the basic idea is that the, so there's this impact on the people who get affected by the assholes, the people who are actually attacked. But there's also this huge impact on the people who see it happen. And if you're in a project that's distributed or that's open source where you've got transparency, everybody sees it. So when you're working in, an, in a distributed company, 
um, the problem gets much, much worse than it would be if you were just on a small team where it's only one team that gets poisoned rather than the whole place. Um, so, you know, the, the numbers are quite astonishing, really, where if you talk 20% of people who see this quit, and this is, this is in a workplace, this isn't in an open source project, so the question is, well, do they really apply? Um, and in my experience, I don't know if that number is right, but I would, I would certainly believe half of it. Just looking at the graph I showed you at the beginning, the number of committers dropping off. Um, we lost 20% of our people in the span of a year. Um, no numbers on this one, but the basic idea is there's all kinds of impacts, not just to the targets, not just to the witnesses, but then in the bigger picture, how does it affect your project? How does it affect your company? Um, and to me, the most important one is you lose your reputation so you can't get good people anymore. And not only do you not get good people, you actively attract bad people. Um, not technically, but people who are total assholes. That it's like a magnet. They just stick to each other. Um, and so you, you bring these people in and every one of them creates like an avalanche. It just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, so, yeah, exactly. So there's actually a metric for this. <laughs> there's a metric for this and you can, add, you can do the math and figure out what is the cost of this person. Because if you're in a business, you, you care about the money. Um, you know, the social side is good, but people are like, oh, well, you know, they're, they're bringing in money, they're bringing in customers, they're so productive. But how do you add up the time they're wasting? Um, and you can work it out. Just say, all right, what am I paying these people per hour to deal with this person? Let's say, you know, the team lead spends five hours every week uh, counseling all of the people who had to deal with this guy. Um, you've got your developer relations team who gets pulled in, or the, your human relations department. You've got high-level leadership, and their time is, you know, ten times more expensive than anybody else's, so they spend half an hour on it, and suddenly you're out 5,000 bucks. Um, your ability to recruit and train is, is hurt. Um, you know, you've got the targets leaving, you've got the witnesses leaving. So these things really add up fast. Um, and I like to look at it as an orthogonal set of axes. You've got technical ability and you've got social ability. And there's no balance between the two. One does not counteract the other, you have to have both. Um, and that's, if I leave you with nothing else, I would say that is the point you should take home with you today. That there, it's not a, a seesaw. You have to have the technical and the social. Um, or you could just hide the asshole in a closet somewhere, and as long as he doesn't have to talk to anybody, things could work out. Um, so then the question becomes, well, what do you do about it? And uh, yeah, it's, it's hard not to be an asshole and drive a Hummer. I don't even know, do these things exist here? <laughs> about the size of four or five cars that I've seen. Um, so yeah, this, this picture is, is kind of interesting to me because not only did the one park over the line, but then the other guy not just didn't park in the spot, but he's in the street. There's a street behind these spots that he's blocking off because he's an asshole too. Um, but so, quite simply, what do, you, what do you do to fix this? And one of the biggest things is very simple. It's just personal interaction like Zach was talking about. Getting people together every six months in person, if you can, do it. Because it's those personal connections that build the relationship and that get people acting more positively with each other instead of just a faceless name on a mailing list or an IRC channel. Um, and another big thing is having a sense that something will happen if they complain. So if you put a note in the suggestion box, you have to know that somebody's gonna read it and it's not, not just gonna stay locked up forever. And not just will they read it, but some kind of action will happen. Because it's when you feel powerless, that's when you leave. When you feel like something will happen, you stick around and try and wait it out and hopefully things will get fixed. Um, and thirdly, what are you here to do? If you're a company that's a training company or a recruitment company, maybe you are here to fix people. But most of us are here to develop a product, a software, or hardware, whatever. Um, so it's not our job to fix people. And sometimes you just have to say, you know, you're not up to snuff, you have to get out of here. Um, go find something else to do because we can't deal with you and we don't have any more time to fix you. It's not worth us, worth our time. Um, but if you're lucky and if, if you're listening to this talk before you have a problem, um, there's a few things you might be able to do to prevent it. <laughs> and Is that in bed? 
in beer. Yeah, vitamin A. I'm just wondering if there's you know, vitamin B. Um, no, I, I think it's in wine. <laughs> So what, what do you do to prevent it? And as you know, you've heard, culture is hard to change. Um, code is much, much easier to change than culture is. It just gets stuck. And without bringing in a whole new team, it, it's a long, long effort to change it. I've been working on it for the past five years in Gentoo, 2 and it's still not there. Um, but one of the big things is do what you can to come up with any kind of numbers to support your claim. If you're trying to um, you know, fix your community or if you're trying to prevent it from happening, you have to have something that you're monitoring, just like you're monitoring whether your server's up. You want to monitor whether your community's up and whether it's healthy. Um, so, you know, looking for things like, are you actually getting complaints about anybody? Is the rate of complaints changing? Um, just very simple stuff. You don't have to go complex engineering on this. Although, if you do, uh, Dave, who's got the next talk, has some really, really cool quantitative stuff on community metrics. I, if he doesn't mention it during the talk, catch him later, because it's very interesting stuff. Um, but you know, people don't always believe that the social side of things is important, especially uh, software developers who really care about code and about things that can be written down and planned and quantitated. Um, so you have to come back at people like that and people like me as a scientist. If there's not evidence, I don't believe you, because you know, as, as analysts, um, it's very easy to talk out of our asses. Um, so we have to do what we can to support our claims as well. Um, and do you have like SWAT teams here? Yeah. yeah. So very simply, yeah, keep your standards high. If you're trying to build a SWAT team of people, don't bring on uh, a traffic cop. And the last one, and the most importantly, is just set your expectations from the start. If you tell people, from the beginning, this is how our community works. This is how, what our standards are like. Um, you're already turning away the people who don't feel like they would fit in. And Ubuntu's done a great job with this, with the code of conduct, where people say, oh, well, this isn't really the kind of community I want to be in. And I can know that just from reading this. But then the problem is, you can't just set the rules. You have to enforce them, too. Um, and that's tough for a lot of us who are sort of introverted, because we don't like confrontations. Um, but if this is something you care about, and it goes back to the health of your entire project, your entire company, um, you have to be willing to take action and do whatever it takes. So I will leave you with the final claim. I will say that dealing with assholes is never worth it. Thank you. <laughs>